Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with uh, some familiar faces. I was going to say old faces. You know who you are. But um, thank you, Paul, for your leadership. Uh, speaking of a test of leadership, Paul does a tremendous job uh, at the helm of this institution and this organization, as you all know. And I was just bragging on him. You know how we Texans love to brag on the terrific report that you all have just done, kind of taking a, a broad view of where we are in American higher education and calling on that, that's, uh, that leadership that is so important uh, to bring to bear in these times. So it's really great to be with you now, what, almost uh, five and a half years since the report came out. and. Uh, gosh, I can't believe four years since I left office. Um, for those of you who are still in public service, you'll be pleased to know there is life after public service, and no matter where you are, uh, once you're bit by this education bug, you can't get out, and I'm sure you'll find your way into something that keeps you on the battlefield. Um, I love visiting with you all because you're on the front lines and you're leaders. And what Paul and I were talking about before we got started this morning is, you know, in Washington, there's a, there's a whole different conversation than what I hear out in the states. You all are not in denial. You understand what's going on. You, you're on the front lines of, of budget battles and resource issues and challenges and completion demands and so on and so forth. And it's not an abstract concept to you like it often is in Washington. You all have, have that urgency. And you see it every day, and you truly are experts. You're leaders and visionaries. and. Uh, Sadly, we don't have enough of that in the Congress the, these days, but maybe some of you will run for Congress. Um, you have a perspective out there in the states that I think is unique, and it's real time and real world. And you have the opportunity, especially now in these, you know, don't waste a crisis times, and maybe Rahm Emanuel used that, that phrase again, to get things done that no one else can or will do. And so it's a fun time to be in your work. It also means, of course, that you have a lot of responsibility, not only for uh, what you do in leading the higher ed aspects of our work, uh, but also in connections with K-12 that we need to do uh, much, much better on. So you've got a tall order. It's a lot of work, you know that, but as they say, anything worth doing is worth doing well. Um, I think one of the things that I've watched over the last two weeks as we head into the closing ceremonies at the Olympics is the awesome commitment uh, that these ath athletes have, this years of hard work, perseverance, the competitive spirit, which have propelled them to the top of their game. And uh, we need a little more of that in American higher education or American education. Just as triumphant as our athletes are, so too should we have that attitude about our, our students as they compete in the global knowledge economy. We've been on top before, as you all know, and I know we can get there again, but it's gonna take different strategies. We, ha we are trying to do something now that we've never done before, and that is educate many, many more people to much higher levels. We've always done a pretty darn good job of educating elites, but that's not the game so much anymore. Obviously, we need to continue to do that. Our challenge now is educating many, many more people. This no child left behind notion that we've had in K-12. Um, it's a different place than where our world is since you and I were in college, and uh, we have to pre be prepared to change to meet these new demands. So what is it going to take to get us back on top? These are some of the things that, that were talked about in the commission report. In my view, for starters, we need more and better information. We need greater transparency. We need more empowered consumers. And we need to embrace innovation in ways that we have not before. And of course, we need leadership. Uh, in Washington, we need leadership in uh, state legislatures, and we need leadership in, in state executive branches, uh, as many of you all serve in. So let's, let's start with data and information. Like it or not, as Paul said, No Child Left Behind has been uh, uh, maybe a sullied brand. I kind of wear that as a badge of honor. If nobody would ever heard of it, uh, it would show that it wasn't really doing anything. People understand. No Child Left Behind and achievement standards have come to every school house in this country. And honestly, I'm sort of shocked and disappointed that the debate has turned really now into why is it that we have to do that? Are these unreasonable standards? Why should we be getting all children to grade level? Which, as I'm sure Secretary Duncan mentioned again yesterday, are pretty low standards, these state standards, as we uh, you know, transition into the Common Core. 
So instead of talking about how we're going to get there, there's a lot of discussion, these waivers and whatnot, about how we're going to cut against those, those meaningful goals and kind of, you know, get, walk away from transparency. But whether you love or hate the law, you know that it has produced a treasure trove of data and information that can help you and can help our K-12 educators do a better job. It's informing the next phase of policy development in ways that have not been possible. Uh, for years, we had a strategy in Washington and frankly, often in state houses before No Child Left Behind called for these more uh, vital and vigorous uh, higher, uh, accountability systems where we just put the money out and hoped for the best. We've tried it for 40 years in Washington. It didn't work very well. Taxpayers knew precious little about how their money was being spent, and that changed, of course, when No Child Left Behind passed. I also, as Paul said, uh, especially in these times when it's so hard to get anything done, uh, really uh, am amazed that we passed the darn thing with 87 to 10 votes in the, in the Senate and a like margin in the House. President Bush, Senator Kennedy, Congressman Boehner, uh, people who don't typically work together, came together on a very big and very powerful idea. They made a commitment to poor and minority children that we'd not done before, uh, and they believed that part of that getting there was to shine a bright light on achievement so that we could make better policy uh, decisions. And it has worked. It absolutely has worked. I think the same can be true for higher education. Do we need no child left behind for higher education? No, we do not. But do we need more information and greater transparency? We do. Taxpayers have a right to expect results. Moms and dads have a right to know, as do students, how, what their kids are getting and how valuable it will be in the marketplace. And you leaders, you higher ed leaders, have a right to expect uh, a return on the policy investments that you're making. You need to understand fully how to calibrate uh, investments in your states. Let's be clear that um, People in the state, the states that you work in, are depending on you to drive reforms. I see it in my own beloved home state of Texas. I don't know if Raymond Prentice is here with us or has gone. I th actually, I think he's not here, is he? Not here. He's to be, to be yeah, because we had talked about that. But I see him and his role. He is looked to as the guy who's gonna, you know, say the tough stuff. And if you don't, no one will. Um, the good news is that you all are not, are not starting from ground zero. Uh, on many indicators, of course, America still leads the pact. Our universities are sought after worldwide. We take great pride in our version of Olympic gold with Nobel Prizes, with Rhodes Scholars, and all the scientific and research breakthroughs that we're so proud of. The bad news is, of course, and you know this, is that other nations are nipping at our heels when it comes to college attainment. They're making investments. For those of you who have traveled around the world, you've seen this. They're laser focused. And they do something that we don't do, and I'm glad we don't, and that is make a uh, you know, one-size-fits-all kind of national approach to these problems. We'll see how they work, but if you've traveled in Asia, you've probably seen some of that. Their investments, um, coupled unfortunately with our complacency about this issue, have uh, contributed to our fall from first place to now 16th in degree attainment behind countries like South Korea, Japan, and Canada. And in an effort to better understand our tumble in the international ranks and identify ways to regain our footing, that's why I convened the commission uh, uh, called the Test of Leadership, uh, the uh, Commission on the Future of Higher Education. I asked, I think, a very august group of folks, bipartisan group of folks, to take a look at these key issues and as uh, Paul said, it gave some folks some heartburn. Um, we know that our global world requires more of us and our systems. Uh, we know a big part of it starts with the inadequacy of our K-12 systems that are not preparing college-ready students. Um, and we know that a part of our, our work has to do with uh, with information. In K-12, sometimes I say we have a lot of inf information now and very few choices, very few ways to empower consumers. In higher ed, it's really kind of the opposite. We have lots of choices and not very much information uh, that empowers consumers. Our challenges are many. The cost, of course, continue to escalate. Tuition rates have been climbing and climbing. Uh, cumbersome applications and a complicated web of grant and scholarship programs make me wonder sometimes whether we're trying to keep kids out of college or whether we're trying to get them in. 
um, really amazing. So there has to be a simpler and clearer way to work on these things. Arne Duncan has done a good job as he has, as he can, uh, given the congressional mandates around uh, financial aid applications to simplify that process. I tried to do some of that. Uh, in the higher ed reauthorization, Paul knows this, we said we need to simplify, please remove these elements, and then they added you know, seven more things to the application. That's Congress for you. Um, but too much of the current debate, I think, is centered around money. We have kind of an accidental strategy of higher ed policy making that has grown up around resources and funding. There's been a lot more discussion in Washington about interest rates and you know, year-round grants, yes or no, and uh, high, whether, these, uh, whether funds can flow to online courses and all the sorts of things about money, as opposed to what is it we're trying to do and for whom. So we need to get away from kind of the tail wagging the dog uh, not that resources are not important, and, and really, I think, more, uh, talk more about a, a strategy that will get us uh, to, to where we want to be on college attainment for a lot more people. We need this discussion about strategies and, and increasing access for student completion, clearly. Uh, the Spellings Commission clearly kicked off some of these policy discussions, and I'm pleased that the business community, and I'm working hard on this in my role at the U.S. Chamber, has carried on with some of these discussions. We've recently released a report called Leaders and Laggards. Leaders and Laggards, you can look it up at the Chamber's website. Uh, it's the Institute for Competitive Workforce, and I hope some of you have already read about this. We've gotten a ton of press hits, 150 or more. Uh, 30 some odd states have uh, focused on this. In fact, uh, West Virginia has formed a task force to look at their rankings and why it is that they did not fare very well in leaders and laggards. We did this in partnership with uh, the Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institute, so that it would be seen as credible and bipartisan. And it looked at a variety of indicators that I want to talk about. Um, the coverage has been amazing, and I think we've really kind of hit the right issues at the right time. So one of the things that we looked at, of course, is access and success. And we found that outside of three states, those being Delaware, Virginia, and Washington, that do have completion rates around 70 percent, statewide rates at four-year public institutions hover about 50 percent. So that's probably not news to you. I hope it's not. I hope you know that already. Completion rates at two-year institutions are about 25 percent. You probably know that, too. Uh, and I think that part of the solution, or what we're finding around the country, is that states believe that part of the solution is to move away from funding models that focus too heavily on enrollment alone. Although such policies help uh, colleges attract students into our systems, it doesn't provide enough emphasis to attend the students who are in college. So states like Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee are just a few of the states that now tie spending to outcomes and completion rates. And I think that's interesting to watch uh, and model. Another solution is to stop making, st stop uh, states from making it harder and more expensive for students to transfer credit between institutions. I hope you all are working on some of these and there are some good models and good examples to take away from our report. Florida's two plus two policy, for example, guarantees that students who earn credits in their community college systems can transfer those into their public four-year institutions. They've done that by creating a common course numbering system, which they did years ago, actually, um, uh, at least a decade ago, as I recall. Cost effectiveness, of course, is another big issue for our states. It's not just how much be we spend, but how well do we spend it. We know from our report that the average cost for degree, for a four-year degree, is about $68,000. For a two-year degree, it's about $57,000. That's a lot, especially if you have college kids. You know what that feels like. So we need to start talking about and looking at efficiency and productivity at institutions and asking questions like, how much do your colleges and universities spend to produce a degree or certificate? You'll find some of that in the report. How, how do such investments uh, compare to other state investments? Particularly in tough economic times, knowing the answers will help you inform spending priorities and help you make your cause for change and for resources when and where they're needed. I'm, I'm encouraged that states like Utah and Missouri, to name just two, are focusing on education outcomes rather than just inputs. 
Uh, a task force in the Show Me State has called for a higher ed funding model that establishes a common performance measure for community colleges and calculates the number of credit hours per $100,000 of state uh, tax dollars invested. States like Tennessee are measuring student learning across their state systems and making the results public. The focus on the quality of students they graduate and the quantity of degrees not produced, uh, uh, produced is, is encouraging. With regard to meeting labor market demands, recent U.S. Department of Labor uh, statistics and data tells us that there are more than three million jobs unfilled. I'm sure you all use these statistics in your own speeches. Uh, here at a time with high unemployment, we have a mismatch between what our, our schools and universities are producing and what the needs of the, of the marketplace are suggesting. That's why we should follow states like Florida who successfully link their post-secondary data and employment records uh, with their education systems. It helps policymakers determine the return on their investment uh, for students and for parents so that they can discern the value and discern uh, what they're getting for their money. In all of these examples, progress has been achieved through more light and more transparency on the higher ed landscape. Where states are exerting strong leadership, colleges and universities are no longer flying below the radar. They're a big part of the policy discussion, and I think that's a good thing. As I said, it helps us make our case in state legislatures for greater investments. It also helps us make the case to families that higher education is still a worthy investment. And I'm sure you probably saw the Wall Street Journal article just, I guess it was just yesterday, about middle income families and how families are truly starting to question the value of higher education. So it's important and incumbent on us to, to fill the need for their demand and answer those questions. Well, the leaders and laggards handed out some of the report's lowest grades to states for their lack of transparency and accountability. Uh, 36 states got D's or F's. I'm encouraged that some of the states that I've mentioned have started to work on those things, and there are some models in there that can show the way for what to do. Minnesota is another state that's producing great publications that can help consumers navigate the landscape. Texas, I can't go without bragging on Texas, has an institutional resume for colleges and universities. Washington's Career Bridge web tool allows prospective students to uh, plug in their career picks and get loads of information about what institutions will best meet their needs. I'm also, of course, encouraged by the 300 or more institutions that have participated in the voluntary school accountability system and their college portraits uh, system that will help consumers. Uh, the one flaw with it, in my view, is that it doesn't uh, provide enough comparable information. I mean, if you're shopping uh, for a product, you want to know kind of the relative value of it. And while the VSA has been a great start, I think we can do more to to have apples and apples comparisons. Other more recent efforts, some of which you all are involved in, the degree, the, uh, degree qualifications profile, are also encouraging uh, steps toward uh, meeting these needs. The final point I want to talk about is innovation. To meet the needs of our, of our society and our students, we need to be more nimble and more flexible and more open to change. And that's hard. That's hard in a system that has a lot of underpinnings of, of tenure and, and administrative sort of history. As I've traveled the world to Asia and the Middle East, it's uh, interesting to me that these, these very uh, uh, less developed systems, really with very little bureaucracy, have leapfrogged ahead of us in doing some interesting things because they're not hidebound by some of the things that we have in place. So it makes our work a little more challenging. But we have to figure out how we're going to change the ways that we've done business. Uh, we know our consumers demand different things than we did. It's not uh, enough to uh, come uh, to a brick and mortar location and, and work uh, you know, with, a, with a human being solely. Our, our kids demand uh, convenient and affordable and technology driven solutions and education. Online learning, of course, is making it easier for what we at the chamber called edupreneurs uh, get into the market. I think we need to welcome the private sector. We know uh, it's hard for us in the public systems to invest capital in these tight resource times. That can be done in the private sector. And a lot of companies are very bullish on the opportunities here. And we need to let them try some things that we can learn some. 
Uh, some states, however, have put up barriers to some of these new providers by uh, providing a lot of fees and a difficult process to enter those markets. But places like Georgia, Georgia and Florida have made it more welcoming for online providers. States like Indiana, Tennessee, North Carolina, Colorado, and Kentucky allow students to get credit uh, at, at technology-based uh, institutions that can transfer into their systems. This openness, I think, is promising not only for the providers, obviously, but most especially for students. While concerns voiced by policymakers are real, uh, many of these providers are responding to high costs. I know there's been a lot of attention. Maybe Secretary Duncan talked about the regulations of the for-profit sector. But I think regardless of our financial structure or their financial structures, what we need to keep our eye on is how are the students doing? How are students doing in your community colleges, in for-profits, your four years? And frankly, we all have work to do. So I know all of this stuff is in your job alone, and I know uh, Secretary Duncan, I'm sure, talked about it as well. We have to do a much better job of linking with our K-12 uh, systems so that we, you all, have uh, better prepared students in your, in your systems. Uh, my role with the U.S. Chamber uh, will allow me to highlight some of those uh, roles. I think as vital as the business community has been in K-12 reform, they need to start engaging in smarter, better ways in higher education and we're gonna work on doing that. So uh, if you please uh, stay in touch with us about how you think we ought to engage the business community. They tend to be not very informed about these issues. Uh, they tend to be uh, very, uh, uh, rely very much on their own personal experience. And I think they, they don't see what we see. And frankly, they need to start aligning, especially big companies, their human resource systems into the kinds of behaviors we want to see. They, wouldn't it be great if they used their tuition reimbursement tools and levers uh, to drive some of the things that we're trying to do? So we hope to engage the business community more vigorously in these discussions as well. As we head into uh, yet another congressional debate on, on higher education, uh, Congress needs your help badly. They need your vision and they need uh, your policy advice as to how to how to act next. So that's why I'm so encouraged by the College Readiness Partnership and the institutions that are participating in that. We have a lot to learn from you all, and I think it can do a lot to help inform uh, the congressional debate moving forward. As I said, and as you know, none of this work is going to be easy, uh, but it's so necessary and it's so timely, and you're on the front lines of what I used to call the next big thing in domestic policy. There's lots of discussion, of course, about health care, but I think we know that the way forward to improving our economy and prosperity and our democracy is through uh, enhanced productivity and opportunity in our higher ed systems. And I look forward to seeing you and working with you over the next many years as we meet those challenges. And I thank you again for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Thank you, Paul.